Good afternoon. Uh, welcome. Thank you, everybody, for joining us uh, for what is uh, the first of our Chatham House Iraq Initiative online uh, webinars. Uh, as many of you know, we have for the last year or so uh, been convening several meetings, whether those are in conversation meetings with uh, Iraqi or sort of international diplomats, Iraqi politicians, or what this is, which is more of an analytical exchange where we bring together an analysts to discuss some of the um, pertinent issues on Iraq. Uh, and due to the COVID crisis, which I'm sure many of you are joining uh, from working from home or from quite uh, safe environments, we have gone online. And so bear with us. This is the first time for us to implement this and hopefully we could have a good conversation as always. So joining us uh, from Baghdad, we have Hannah Adwar, who is probably a known to many of you, a woman who really needs no introduction, uh, for decades has been a, a top activist in Iraq, fighting for civil society and fighting for uh, better accountability. She is the chairperson of the Al Amal organization. Next, we have Professor Toby Dodge, a professor of international relations uh, at the LSE, and also uh, my colleague as an associate fellow working with me on the Iraq Initiative. Next, we have uh, Dr. Max Gelton, the director of uh, the Institute of Regional and International Studies at the American University of Iraq in Suleymaniyah. And finally, we have Ahmed Tabakchali, uh, who, uh, another, again, very well-known sort, of sort of investment officer, chief investment officer of the Asia Frontier uh, Capital. So as you can see, what we've tried to do is to bring together a, a, a array of speakers, each with a different specialty, but each which could speak to one of the different uh, challenges um, that Iraq currently faces. Because when we began the Iraq initiative, of course, the idea was the country has just come out of this fight against ISIS. ISIS is no longer uh, a threat to the country. How do we move towards stabilization? How do we move towards reconstruction? And these were the big themes. But lo and behold, again, what we have is Iraq, which is facing what some are calling a, uh, a, the perfect storm, perhaps. You've had protests since October, killing over 600 and injuring tens of thousands with the violence and the protests that, that have continued today. And we'll have Hana particularly address where the protests are going. You also have the COVID-19, this, you know, the, the health scare. And we have, we're lucky to have Mac joining to talk on whether Iraq is capable uh, or able to go through what could be a disaster in the health sector, Mac being an anthropologist of public health in Iraq. We, of course, then have this oil price decline, decline to lower levels in, in quite a long time. And we'll need to flush all of that out as we try and understand the economic uh, future for, for Iraq. And, and, and at the same time, you also have the US-Iran uh, dispute looking like it's escalating with what's coming from Pentagon and, and, and the US uh, in the last few days and, and some of the different militias that are looking to attack uh, U.S. and U.S. nationals and the threats that have escalated. And finally, all of this is happening while Iraq hasn't had a prime minister, or at least hasn't had a sworn in prime minister since our, our Prime Minister Adil Abdul Mahdi's resignation in November of 2019. And, and so we'll have to kind of uh, get into that discussion, perhaps with Toby. But to begin, I just wanted to offer a brief sort of introduction to help tailor the, uh, the conversation today. We've been going to Iraq for, for you know, every month or two uh, for the last few years, especially doing lot, lots of work there, meeting with different people. And really what we've come to at the end of this is this, uh, uh, this gap between the, the leadership, which is fragmented, and the people. You have, and, and it's like the elite and, and many of the protesters, but also society more generally are speaking past each other. And you don't really have a, a common language. You don't have an understanding of what are the expectations of protesters, who are the protesters, what are the expectations of the elite. So the, we're, we're stuck, we're at an impasse when it comes to politically how we can move forward. And I was looking actually at, um, you know, knowing that these protests are different and we, we, we know these protests demographically are different. We know that these protests 
uh, the demands are different. There's been a lot of analysis, but we're looking at how the elite have responded to protest in the past. And I, and, and I looked back to, for example, 2011 in Basra. At the time, in 2011, Nouri al-Maliki, as prime minister, realized in the Shia heartland, there's a protest demanding similar things, anti-corruption, better governance, accountability. And he employed a series of tools under public authority to maintain that authority. He, to some extent, used ideology, using Ba'athism and Shiism quite effectively to try and bring the society together. He also used economic promises, promising rations, promising jobs, and people believed it, you know, believed that they would get more jobs and the public employment as a redistributor of funds and wealth continued. And finally, he did use coercion. And there are people who are still, who have escaped, who have, aren't allowed to go back to, to Baghdad or the South. So that is to say that there was a policy of using these different types of tools to maintain order, but to kind of find a solution, if you will, to, to protest in that way. What you have today is a bit of a different uh, answer to protest, as the elite are no longer able to use ideology in the same way they used to, democratization, Baathism, Shiism, or any type of ideology. The elite are also no longer able to promise jobs and make people believe it uh, and promise rations. And, and so because of that, they're turning more and more towards coercion. And so you have this mass violence, violence that has entered into the equation. Um, and, and, and so this has created a new problem. And we know that where Maliki did use violence in 2011 wasn't in the South, but it was in the Sunni areas of Northwestern Iraq. And we saw the result of that in, in greater conflict. Um, so the use of coercion into the Iraqi political space is, is something that I think we need to discuss uh, moving forward on, on all sides. And finally, the final point I would make is really, there is a logic that has guided Iraq since 2000. And three. And that logic is that you have this elite, these stakeholders, who all to some extent realize that they're all in it together, that they need to pr play formal politics, but at the end of the day, they need to preserve that pie. Everyone has a piece of the pie. Now, what we've seen, especially since 2018 in those elections, is there's all these newcomers that have come in, and you have this massive fragmentation of who the elite are. So when in 2005, you had one Shi political bloc, you had a Kurdish political bloc, and you had a Sunni kind of secular political bloc. Today, the Da'wah party as a party is split. The PUK has two leaders. Many of these parties have internal fragmentations and each side has more expectations. This is all to say that the reason why for the first time a prime minister designate was unable really to, to find a mandate and why the next prime minister designate, Zurfi, is also having issues is because of this fragmentation, both horizontally within the elite, but also this inability to reply uh, to, to uh, the protests. So that was my introduction. I know exactly what Toby will say as, as he brings, but we will begin with Professor Toby Dodge. Uh, and the question that I have for Toby, we'll, we'll begin with elite politics, and then we'll get to Hannah to talk about the protest dynamics. But on the question of what will happen, will this prime minister, sort of the, the designate, will he be able to achieve a mandate? Why was Muhammad Tawfiq Alawi unable to achieve that mandate? What to you are the key issues that we should be looking out for when trying to understand in Iraq, as they, in Iraq, as they say, the hosa that is uh, elite politics in Iraq today? Toby, over to you. Thank you. Um, hopefully in a, a short period of time than the chair, I'll try and expand on some of those issues. I mean, the first thing to keep in mind is how the system is meant to work, regulated under the Iraqi constitution of 2005. Now, after each election under Article 26 of the Constitution, the President of Iraq um, selects a Prime Minister designate from the largest bloc in Parliament, um, and he then has, or she, potentially she then has, 30 days to appoint a government. And after each of the elections in 2005, in 2010, 2014, that Prime Minister designate has created a grand coalition uh, dividing up the cabinet posts and the resources that come with them amongst the victorious parties and electoral blocs that won the election. Now, clearly, um, that system isn't working after the 2018 elections. Firstly, as Renad was saying, because the, 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 both the, person, the political personalities 
the political parties and much more importantly, the blocks, the electoral coalitions that they are uh, brought into have fractured. For example, there were five different electoral vehicles trying to chase the majority sheer vote in 2000 and, uh, 2008, 2018, up from three in 2014 and basically one in 2005. So there's a lot more people chasing a lot more votes. But I think much more intriguingly than that, the ideological platforms from which they're running on have become much more diversified. So after the 2018 elections with historic low of electoral turnout, indicating that the population as a whole were alienated from the system. When uh, the president, then Baham Saleh, went to pick a, uh, a prime minister designate, who became Adel Abdel Mahdi, there was no agreement on who the largest bloc was in parliament. And also there was no political agreement on So as uh, Renad was saying, Adel Abdul Mahdi was forced to resign at the end of November uh, 2019 in the face firstly of mass demonstrations that Hannah will talk about, but also undeniably very high levels of state-sponsored uh, violence to try unsuccessfully to suppress those uh, demonstrations. Uh, Mohammed Tafik Alawi is appointed as the designate candidate to form a government, designate prime minister, and fails in a month to bring together that coalition. Why does he fail? I think it's fascinating because Mohammed Tafik Alawi was clearly a member of the elite, had been a cabinet minister, was very familiar to the elite. But what he was trying to do was bring in, albeit a tepid and watered down commitment to reform the system, to bring in a technocratic government that would avoid the corruption and inefficiency that the Iraqi cabinet has become notorious for. Key members of that ruling elite, uh, the Barzani clan that run the Kurdistan Democratic Party and al Busi, the Speaker of Parliament, refused to sign up to that reform agenda. And so, um, Mohammed Tafik Alawi couldn't form a government because that reform agenda was seen as antithetical to the interests of key members of the elite. Adnan Al-Zerfi was uh, appointed on the 16th of March and he has now till the 15th of April, two weeks left to form this government. But Zerfi's own history as a pro-American anti-militia governor of Najaf, um, as a man who was committed to a populist and possibly reforming platform in Najaf has alienated key sections again of that ruling elite, specifically the Fatah coalition run by Hadi Al Amri, who has said overtly that they won't back his premiership. So I think the key takeaway from this, from this inability to find a prime minister that can build a coalition government is that the elite itself, when faced with failure of the system, when faced with what Nad has described as this perfect storm, cannot find enough coherence, enough consensus to build a cabinet and move forward. And I think the system with its decentralized, corrupt and inefficient nature needs a centralizing figure in the prime minister's office, if only to iron out the inefficiencies and to keep the thing moving forward. And it hasn't got that and it's not likely to have that for quite some time to come. Thank you, Toby. Uh, thank you for sticking to time. Uh, I know that was uh, a bit harder than, than you had liked. Uh, but also thank you for that wonderful outline of, of, of the sort of elite politics. Um, I want to now go towards um, Hana Edouard is joining us from Baghdad, where she might actually have better internet than Toby sitting in the UK. I don't know what that says. But the question I have for, for Hana is we've did, we're looking at protests. October to now is a long time. Many people are questioning, A, what will happen to the protests? Are the numbers dying down? Is this just another protest that eventually goes down until another eruption happens? Or are you seeing something different in the after, the next steps for these protesters? Are they genuine? What are, what are some of the sort of key takeaways from what you see as current and the future dynamics of protests, given your experience, your personal experience and professional experience in protesting in Iraq for you know, many decades? 
thank you, Renat. It's uh, really what we have seen since uh, 17 years ago and now, if we want to judge about the development or the political process in the country, we see in each uh, period there is some a new element is getting in, in this political process. Especially when we speak about the protest and about, you know, the movement, the uh, people's movement. It is becoming more, how you say it, uh, developed and developed in with uh, new awareness. And I think that's when I made uh, emphasis on the new awareness. What Toby has mentioned about the ideology of the system in Iraq, which based on the Islamist political system and on the elites, especially about the Shiiten and so on. Now we have seen the change in the in new protest uh, since the beginning of 1st of October where you can see that in these you know, cities of the Shiiten in the southern and in the central of Iraq has spread all these demonstrations and it's been continuous going on. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that with all this development now, after since the 1st of October and now, especially after the increasing of Corona, that the demonstrators are still in, in the square Tahrir and in some other areas of uh, other cities in Iraq, they are still insisting that they have to continue. And they have taken really a very, uh, how we say it, uh, caring measures against the corona and, uh, and some health, uh, how we say it, uh, guidance in their daily uh, of being there in the square, in the square. So, and they are also participating in the popular, in the popular awareness against, you know, Corona and all these questions. This is, it means that these people is not just like they are uh, protesting, but they are trying to give a new vision in the country and especially for the, uh, for the political system that people, they have to be active in decision making about the, uh, how you say it, the development of the political process in the country. Uh, here also, I would like to mention that, uh, though that's, uh, this is something which is appear now, that these young people, mostly of them, they are young people. And most of them, they are even, I can say, uh, not very high, uh, how you say, the study, but in, in general, they are in the mid, in the mid of uh, education but with the political analysis and the perspective of their uh, activities and their uh, continuous uh, protest, it seems that they have really a good vision about the uh, future of the, about the future of our country. Here, uh, of course, that's within the last, you know, since uh, end of uh, February, that the declining of the, uh, the number of people in the protest due to corona, due to the uh, lethal force has been used against the people. And especially as they said, the uh, demonstrators themselves, that many of these people, they are depending on their daily work, the revenue of their daily work. When they are now, they passed five months without, you know, revenue for their uh, income, for their families and for, uh, for themselves, it is very hard for them. So they have been obliged to continue their daily work. And then after the, the, the work, they come to join the demonstration. This is, it's not easy. But of course, there is also the propaganda has been used against them, the aggressiveness by certain political parties and the politicians against them, the abductions, the assassinations, as you said, mentioned that more than 600 people been, you know, uh, killed and uh, so many of them, they be still, their, uh, their destiny is unknown and many of them, they are abducted and they've been tortured and so on. So this is, it was very brutal against them. But in the in, uh, in turn that we can say that the, their determination for continuation of their work, of their activities, this is, it has really to say that we are very proud about these young people and about their vision about the development of the 
for building a new system in Iraq. It's not easy, and they don't have really big power, but we can see the, their achievements as following. Uh, they have, they could really, when they insist about the resignation of the government, it has been done. At the end of November, the government been resigned. With all they tried, this uh, government tried to exist or to continue, but it was very difficult for them. Then the peaceful or the passions of their work, the peaceful uh, demonstrations, has really, uh, how we say, uh, uh, demonstrated that uh, within this peaceful, they could really make good uh, effective on majorities, many millions of people who have been, you know, uh, supported them and they have given them all the, uh, how we say, it, solidarity uh, to continue there. And we can see that from the huge numbers of people joining the demonstrations, especially the students, the uh, young people, and some other, you know, civil uh, society movement and uh, intellectual, even they join. And this is, it is really something which we admire about it. And especially here, I want to focus that the participation of women was one of the uh, how we say it, brilliant things in the in this uh, protest when we can see that with all these ideologies since 17 years we're trying to make you know uh, the image of women is uh, in a very uh, down in the down low but no now women participating young women participating in the demonstrations in the different fields of these demonstrations not only as first aid or medical or in services but they are leading the demonstrations and this is one of the issues that we are really seeing a proud uh, of these young people they are trying to make a new uh, a new uh, how we say it, movement, to build a new movement which has been uh, regardless of uh, sex or gender or regardless of religious, regard, regardless of uh, geographic, you know, uh, uh, representation. You can see that from many of these uh, people, they come from in Baghdad, in Baghdad demonstrations, for, for instance, many of young people, they have come from different sections from Ramadi, from Tiala, from Salahuddin, from Mosul, from Basra, from Kut, from Najaf, and they joined, uh, they come together and they live together for five months, and five months in a very poor situation. This is, it, it is something we have to say that it is tremendous, and it is really amazing that these young people, they have been very different from other protest demonstrations in 2011 or 2016 or 15. Thank you. So the, this is what I would like to mention about it and to stress about it. Maybe we can speak much about it. Sure. Thank you, uh, Hannah. That was a very good uh, sort of background and overview of where the protests are uh, today and where we see them going. And, and I'm sure through the questions, uh, we'll continue to talk about the situation and what the future of protests are, whether it's a political process, whether it's moving into civil society or any other process. But already the word has come up several times and already there are questions being asked on our Q&A function. It's about Corona and it's about COVID-19. And we're lucky to, to have with us Dr. Max Gelton, who is a medical anthropologist who has been studying the Iraqi public health sector uh, for many years uh, and, and is now in Iraq, well, not currently, but working at the American University of Iraq in Suleimania. Mac, I wanted to ask, um, earlier this year, uh, the first resignation came from the Minister of Health. And the Minister of Health resigned criticizing the extent of corruption uh, in the ministry. Given the political economy and the politics that Toby outlined at the elite level, should we be worried about the potential of corona and what it could mean for Iraq if the cases especially increase? Uh, <clears throat> Uh, thanks, Renaud. Um, in, the, in short, yes. Uh, right now, there is a um, you know, relatively low caseload, uh, around uh, 520 cases as of yesterday. 
and uh, just a little over 40 deaths. Uh, but in talking to a number of doctors across the country over the, over the past week, uh, the, the general consensus is that if this number grows, and by the way, this number is um, you know, uh, probably not accurate at all, and I'll get to that later. Uh, if this number grows, uh, the capacity issues will be uh, rather extreme. So if we think about capacity in a couple different ways, uh, once uh, on the one hand, you have um, you know, acro across Iraq's provinces, insufficient ICU beds, facilities, ventilators, testing kits, pr personal protective equipment. And we hear these things um, uh, really across the world. Um, but we also have sort of um, uh, more intangible forms of ca capacity. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the capacity for hospitals to coordinate among themselves and have a, co a coherent response. One doctor told me that um, in the first week of the outbreak, many hospitals inside each province uh, were refusing to check those who developed cor coronavirus-like symptoms uh, and refer them to another hospital or to another province uh, and trying to refer them back to the first province that they visited. Uh, in, some of the, in some cases, uh, these hospitals were um, uh, quarantine, quarantining the patients in, in ambulances, uh, you know, until they received further instructions. And so capacity having this, um, uh, you know, uh, not only a technological side, but this very complex uh, kind of uh, communication and coordination side um, <clears throat> raises the question of, uh, of management at different levels. So if we think about why is this the case, um, this gets back to, to Renaud's question. While, of course, um, yes, there's no uh, PM, uh, there's been basically no budget decided upon yet. Uh, there's huge budget short pause for the Ministry of Health both last year and there will be this year. Uh, the, the problems are more deep, deeply structural, and I would, I would break it into three periods. In, in the 1990s, you basically had the technological evisceration of the healthcare system uh, through the sanctions. Um, hospitals, medical supplies were not able to be updated for about 13 years. Um, hospitals are very complicated technological networks, uh, and essentially cutting them off from the rest of the world for that period of time was devastating. Then after um, 2003, we have uh, two more kind of movements. One is a loss of uh, Iraq's uh, medical human resources, uh, anywhere from a third to a half um, left because of the violence. Um, but then we also have a kind of politicization of, of the ministry. Uh, and we see this across Iraq's ministries where you have a particular political bloc that sort of owns that ministry and becomes uh, responsible for managing it, but is actually diverting more resources towards putting their people in the right positions and, uh, um, and so on and so forth. And so this kind of process of politicization of medicine uh, has led to a lot of these issues of, uh, of broader dysfunctionality across uh, the ministry. So uh, epidemics bring up two aspects. They bring up uh, both the um, uh, capacity of the medical system and then also the societal response or compliance issues, right? And what we see in relationship, you know, the society's relationship to medicine in Iraq, uh, people have uh, for the past few years really been voting with their feet. Uh, they, you know, across social classes, and, and there's been serious studies on this, uh, and I've been a part of a few of them, uh, we, we've looked at um, the way in which uh, across uh, both, uh, you could say, low and high class, across the, the range of social classes, people are paying uh, big sums of money to go over uh, across borders to Lebanon, uh, Turkey, Jordan to get care instead of getting, um, uh, having to interact with the public health care system in Iraq. Um, and so uh, you, you have a kind of breakdown in the trust between uh, society and the medical system. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and that's why a lot of times connecting to Hana's uh, presentation, uh, in the squares you saw patients and doctors uh, both kind of expressing their discontent uh, with the current situation. So uh, <clears throat> all that to say, um, uh, the, the situation is concerning, uh, but we have to look at um, both uh, the kind of immediate uh, budget sh shortfalls that have led to this and you know, the political instability, but also these deeply structural issues. 
and not just think about capacity in terms of, hey, we need some more ventilators and some more uh, personal protective equipment. Uh, the bigger question of how to restore capacity within the healthcare system has to address these more intangible issues. Uh, and unfortunately, they are so intertwined with politics and the kind of political economy of the, the healthcare system that they're very difficult to address. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Mac, for that general sort of background and, and quite deep understanding of how the health sector works. Um, and I'm sure as we, as we move on, uh, we'll get, we're already getting a few questions in about the specifics of what Corona actually means uh, for, the, for the political process, for the protest, for the elite and everything. But before that, let's just add another variable into this perfect storm. And that is the oil price and the decline. Because I remember we've had several meetings with, with Ahmed and while the protests were going on and the one thing that he was adamant on was as long as the oil price remains the same, we will, uh, we will survive. I mean, somehow the system would be able to fund itself. But what we've seen, Ahmed, is now that the oil price has gone down and it's down, gone down to sort of levels that it hasn't been for, for a while. Have you changed your analysis? What are you looking at? What are the biggest fears, not just for the oil and the oil sector, but how you view this as contributing to all of the crises that we've already been talking about with, with the other speakers? Hello, all. Thank you, uh, uh, Renard. Basically, I haven't really changed my view, but the fact right now, instead of being helping the country survive or uh, allowing it to maintain, it now will be a crucial issue on how can it continue. Uh, oil has provided, or, or, or the oil revenues have provided the where the where with all for the state to function, the where with all for the state to uh, buy loyalties, to carry on, to function. Everything that we discussed about how the mahasa works depends on this huge rent income that comes from oil that allows them to do all of these things. Now, the issue with 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 right now, and where it is a danger, I think, for Iraq, uh, it is actually, in a sense, probably the the uh, most severe danger that we've seen. The question that we have, and, and in a way like people like me to look at really how uh, it looks, is the severity and the extent of the damage really depends, in a sense, on oil prices, which in turn, this time, this time around, depend on the coronavirus itself. Keeping in mind the reason why this is so important and why the uh, dislocations could be significant this time, unlike other times, is that keep in mind 75% of the demand for oil in the Western world or developed world is for transportation. And we all know what happened in China and we've all seen the lockdown that we've all seen worldwide. The upshot of this is that uh, currently right now you're seeing estimates which are all over the place in terms of demand erosion. And they range from 5 million barrels a day to 25 million barrels a day from a base of uh, oil demand of about 101 million uh, barrels per day. So you're talking a significant amount. Now, how big and how long that is, it all depends on how long the lockdown lasts worldwide. By all account, if the lockdown lasts longer, you're keeping in mind they're getting closer and more and more likely to the 20 million decline in, 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 uh, in demand. Now, Beyond that is, once we go through the hump of coronavirus, how do we go back to normal? Do we go back to the same normal we had? Or do we go back to a new normal whereby there's going to be less transportation? All of this affects a forward trajectory for oil prices. Now, before I go on on, on, on mentioning the oil price, I would like to say something which, in a way, uh, a U.S. economist uh, called Edgar Fiedler had mentioned before and said, the herd instinct among forecasters makes sheep look like independent thinkers. So in a way, I don't want to be like the, 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 the current sheep around that are talking about low oil prices. But the difference between where we are right now in oil prices and where we were prior, keep in mind we had the oil price crash in 2014, 2015, which Iraq barely survived and uh, uh, was entwined with Isaac. We've had a 209, uh, which actually in a way drives the mentality of the Iraq government in the sense that things will be over. The difference between this time and all the prior times is the extent of the destruction or the extent of disappearance of demand short term. In 2008 and 9, we had a drop in demand, but we did not have the world shut down like we have right now. Uh, so in a sense, you have that one. Plus, normally what happens is when oil prices drop, they tend to stimulate demand, i.e. they tend to, you know, people tend to, to use it more. But when you're not driving anywhere, when you're not going anywhere, 
that won't, won't work in terms of demand uh, uh, simulation. So in a sense, it asks you, where would the oil price be uh, medium term? Now, whichever way I look at it, you know, slicing and dicing it, I really cannot see oil prices, and I'm talking about average for the next 12 months. So I'm not talking today or tomorrow, but an average for the next 12 months, I can't see it higher than, let's say, 40, 45 uh, for Brent maximum, with a likelihood of 30 to $35 a barrel lasting for a considerable period of time, at least until the end of the year. So, okay, if we accept that, where does that put Iraq? Where does that put uh, the survival of the system or the functionality of the system. In a sense, if you look at it, uh, if you ever really heard the uh, politicians or others talking about the Iraqi budget of 2020, in which was going to be a record budget, so forth, that was a pipe dream to start with, even when we had oil prices at over $50 a barrel. So where would it be? I am I'm basically uh, looking at using 2019 as a base, because unless we get a new government, we're not likely to change our budget, and I can't see uh, the wherewithal to change the budget anyways. So you look at that, the base spending of the budget is currently about $89 billion, uh, billion if you look at uh, 2019, of which $64 billion goes to salaries and uh, goes into uh, pensions and so forth. With all price revenues of ranging between uh, something like 30, million to, uh, 15, uh, 30 billion to 50 uh, billion, that leaves a huge deficit which means they will do dramatic cuts in uh, capital expenditure. They will cut spending on almost everything apart from salaries. But if they do this, they can fund it for about up to 12 months because we have significant reserves of about $67 billion. But once that's over, what do you do? What, that, what, what do you do? So in a sense, most countries, I finished in a way, most countries can do fiscal stimulus, Iraq can't, because if we do fiscal t- stimulus, i.e. spending on the economy, we bring in the day of reckoning sooner. So a year is nothing in, the, in, this, in this environment. So within a year's time, they have to make serious choices. And sorry, I lasted longer than I planned. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ahmed, that was great. And uh, as, as usual, you've stimulated quite a few questions. Uh, I, I want to ask everyone to keep the questions coming. We will t- start to integrate them and, and I will kind of group them together and then ask them to the speaker uh, who they're addressed to or the speaker who has been speaking on that theme. Before that, there's just one variable, one element that we haven't yet discussed, which is quite important. And that is the escalation between the US and Iran. What we've seen is certainly certain, not just US government officials, but certain analysts based in DC who are also now advocating for a more kinetic response uh, in in taking out Iran's assets in in Iraq. Toby, I wanna ask this question to you um, from your sort of academic background, but also as you, in your time with Petraeus um, and and your background in international kind of sort of state building and the, of Iraq, what do you think, what should be done to should you know what what would you be doing if you were to advise the U.S. and as well as advise the Iranian, let's say, on how to navigate this storm in a way? Over to you. Thank you. Well, I think what's shocking about the discussions in and around the Trump administration at the moment is that the key lessons of 2003 tend to have been forgotten. The first lesson was that kinetic power violence, the use of weapons, cannot solve political problems. Now, of course, there is a war of tip for tat, tat, a kind of low-grade struggle of attrition between Iran and its allies on the ground in Iraq and the United States with those allies trying to drive the United States out of Iraq. Now, that's understood. But um, the attack, uh, uh, the assassination of Qasem Soleimani and uh, Abu Mahdi al-Mahandis on January the 3rd was meant to somehow restore strategic deterrence from the United States using force to, to, to heighten the cost. And that simply failed. If anything, it has accelerated the use of, of violence, of missiles primarily by Iran's allies on the ground in Iraq against US bases. So I think somehow that those that are adv- uh, advocating a kind of um, military strike using air power against the, the, the leadership of Qatar and Hezbollah, amongst others, have lost uh, the analytical insight 
that Carter Pence are primarily a political problem. They indicate that the Iraqi state hasn't got control over its territory, has nothing like and never has had since 2003 a monopoly on violence. And the militias aligned with Iran are also very powerful domestic players integrated into sections of Iraqi society with huge influence both in Iraqi parliament on the street um, and amongst the ruling elite. So in a fantasy world, if you use uh, a military strike against them, all you're gonna do is rally much, well, you're gonna kill a lot of innocent Iraqis, which is the main worry. You're then gonna rally um, uh, anti-American sentiment against the United States, whose diplomatic and soft power presence on the ground in Iraq is lamentably weak at the moment. And then you're gonna shrink the space for liberals, for civil society activists, for those the United States should be encouraging, or at least hoping that they can shift the balance in Iraqi politics. You're gonna do them great damage, as indeed the murder of uh, Qasem Soleimani and Abdul Mahdi al-Mahandis did in early January. So this, the, the proposal of yet more kinetic force, yet more violence, yet more air power, I think is based on a fundamental misunderstanding understanding of Iraqi politics and what the use of military force can do in Iraq. Thank you. Thank you, Toby. Um, so let's get to some of the questions that have been asked. And again, I'm going to group them based on who they're directed towards. And I wanted to begin with Hanat because there were a few questions on the protests. Um, the questions surround primarily what comes next. Do you think that these protests are, can establish themselves in an almost middle approach? Is there a middle approach, there's a question coming in, of moving towards a political movement? There's another question that's being asked on the fact that these protests don't have leaders. So how can they, if they don't have leaders, uh, be sustainable in the long term? So if you can, in a few minutes, Hannah, just reflect on these protests, do you see them moving towards a sustainable uh, political movement, a sustainable political party, what are the impediments and can they overcome those impediments? Uh, here I would like to, to from our follow-up and our connections with many of these, you know, uh, demonstrators and especially the uh, leaders of them, we can say that there are some development of trying to create a new political movement among them. There is an attempt, there is some attempts of that, not only in Baghdad, but in different cities. This is, it is not easy. I can say that, of course, all of us, we are trying to encourage this a new movement to be emer to emerge, but it is not easy, especially these people without any experience, without knowledge of you know uh, establishing such political movement. Anyhow, but I feel that now there are some how you say development on this issue uh, in Baghdad, in uh, Nasiriyah, in Basra also and in some other areas, which is really one of the positives that the coordinations among these protests is becoming more, how we say, it, uh, practical. There are, how we say, it, visits among different of these, you know, uh, groups from different areas, from different cities, which also it is uh, pushing for, the, for a political movement to be built in the coming months. It needs, it needs help. It needs from us as civil society uh, to give them, you know, more experience, not only to give them more experience, but to, to encourage them and to give, to give them more support to sustain. It is not easy, but I think there are some attempts of that. Especially that we can say from their uh, dealing with the politicians, it, uh, they have developed a good, uh, how we say, uh, practice on them. We can say that from their uh, dialogue with some of these, you know, politicians, with their, you know, pushing about their uh, criteria of the new prime ministers or the new government. It has been really, how we say, they get, they gain the support from the Marjaiya and they gain the support from many of the uh, patriotic and national other uh, uh, political parties. This is essential. It doesn't, it depends on them only. 
it depends on the how we say it, the development of the whole uh, movement the political parties who are against the uh, political process or they are in oppositions of this political process also depends on the participation of the intellectual people it is still you know not very close uh, how we say it to be in close uh, with these demonstrators so there are some with the new with the new development of the corona and this it has really made some stop on that and they have negatively in somehow affected the development of this process but first of all also i would like to mention that the achievements of you know the change in the country they have really made a good uh, how we say it, a good uh, uh, insist of the the change has to come to the political process in iraq and this is it has uh, i can say that from different you know aspect from different uh, movement it is had has really get the support especially that the marjaia especially that the many of these you know uh, politicians whom they are not even the political parties and against the uh, muhasasa and against corruptions which is the main main hindrance of the, the development of the political process in iran in a, in a positive way thank you hana and as as you speak even more questions are coming uh, your way so we'll get back into this but uh, i just want to turn over to ahmed uh, ahmed has a, there's there's been several questions now addressed to you after your talk uh, a quite alarming uh intervention you had you mentioned for example the serious choices uh that that the Iraqi government will have to face what did you mean you know what what are those serious choices that that the government will have to face that the officials will have to face um there's another question on what would the impact be on the dinar uh moving forward there's another question on whether Iraq might have to go back to the IMF and and what sort of if you can come up with a few sort of what you see scenarios of there's a question on if we assume that the oil price remains at 30 dollars what does that mean for the the protest that Hana is talking about for the elite politics that Toby is talking about for the corona scare that Mac is talking about where do you see at the end of 2020 and I know it's hard to predict this 2020 is a crazy year so far but at the end of 2020 where do you see it if the oil price remains like that if the i mean in very briefly if the oil price remains at this price and the government does what i think is going to do which is basically normally bury your head in the sand cut spending on infrastructure cut spending on everything apart from salaries year end they will be in in creating the same conditions to make the demonstrations last longer because keep in mind what actually got the demonstrations going was the damage done to the informal economy the first wave of demonstrations was the informal economy was the crackdown on the informal economy the arab spring started by the crackdowns or by the extent of the informal economy cannot survive now looking at the overall questions uh, what, what does the budget look like for iraq i think uh, to be very brief uh, i there was there's an article that i wrote for the lse which has a table which gives you what the budget would look like under various scenarios in terms of oil prices and the 30 dollar price is there it actually it looks very dire by then and that pretty much comes down to what are they doing right now what are they doing everything i've heard from the ministry of oil which is asking all the oil companies to cut capital spending by 30% the uh, ministry of uh, electricity asking everything to do with maintenance with any kind of work to pretty much to put a break to it because the real panic that they have is they want to ensure that they can pay salaries now that if they carry on like that you'll last to 2020 you'll pretty much burn through a lot of the reserve what means that means that you probably run to something like depending on the exact oil price but you probably run to something like 4 to 5 months of exports 4 to 5 months of exports means you cannot support your uh, currency anymore you cannot you cannot have enough currency to buy your imports which means we have to look at devaluing the dinar or even if they keep the dinar uh, where it is officially the market price will be substantially higher now normally in most productive economies when the currency weakens it tends to help the local economy in the sense that the products and goods that you produce become cheaper and more competitive international 
But guess what? As we all know, we don't really make anything. Our, most of our private sector is mostly in services, is mostly in retail, is mostly in, 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 in the basic hospitality areas and so forth. And none of these are really productive in a big way apart from paying salaries because we use almost everything else. So the DNR could be a uh, structure. Now the real question, which is what I mentioned, the critical choice the government has to make is you need to come clean uh, with the people. In a sense, we need to end this whole ideas of, let's say, electricity subsidies or fuel subsidies. These are the ones that are killing uh, the government, killing the country in a sense. The, the, the amount of waste that you uh, look at in terms of the fuel subsidies we have and the electricity subsidies are massive, are beyond measurement. They, what they do is that they, they siphon money away from uh, uh, investment infrastructure and they starve it. So in a sense, you have to come clean. You have to be upfront with the people and tell them these are the choices. The choices are a serious tightening of belts. We lose a lot of the, uh, the, 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 say, the, the socialist element of the country. And that is something that none of them have ever wanted to do. Always, always, is every crisis, they cut on investment spending, they cut on everything, just maintain salaries till the last minute. This time they're doing the same thing, hoping that they will be uh, bailed out. And that's where they have to come clean. If you have to come clean, then obviously you really have the question of, am I representing the people? Am I, do I have a new social contract with them? And that pretty much all comes to Toby and to, uh, to Hannah. Thank you, Ahmed, for, for that. Um, and there's a few questions that will come back to you on dipping into the reserves and what that means for the DNR. But I want to turn over to Mac again on the, on the question of COVID-19. There's been a few questions coming in. One, you know, everything you described on, you know, this perfect storm, the, the ministry, does this, the, the, would the failure of the Ministry of Health play at any to the hands of the protesters? in sort of a case study of that misgovernance and mismanagement since 2003. Um, and another question uh, that came through is, if you take a regional assessment of, of how different regional governments will respond to COVID-19, is Iraq uniquely vulnerable? What, or, or is it the same as other governments? What, what would you point at as perhaps some of the uniqueness, if there are any, of Iraq's uh, public health sector? Sure. Um, so for the first question, would this play into the hands of the protesters or have some sort of relevance in the protests? Uh, we, we've seen throughout the protests uh, that uh, the figure of doctors and patients has been prominent. Uh, and I think it carries symbolic weight. Um, would the failure of the, of the ministry play a, a sort of a add sort of inject a uh, sort of extra um, impetus into the protest? I, I almost think not because this failure has been um, long in the making and it's uh, been pervasive uh, for years. Uh, and the sort of breakdown between um, state and society within, you know, in relation to the healthcare sector is a long-term issue that is, uh, goes far beyond um, COVID-19. You know, a, a lot of what you've seen in the press over the last few days, uh, it was you know even New York Times was saying that uh, one of the reasons why the numbers uh, coming out of Iraq uh, are low is because uh, due to tribal norms, people don't want to go to the hospital or whatever. This is really a, a very kind of like exoticization of uh, a much simpler issue. Uh, in Iraq, there is a history of excellent health care. People know what a good hospital is supposed to look like, and they know that they're not getting that now. And so there, the deterioration is more a question of capacity and that capacity not being there. And so society having this sort of alienated relationship with the ministry. But it's again, it's a long term issue. So in terms of comparisons with the region, uh, there, there are certain kinds of things you can look to that would uh, point to a big problem for Iraq. There's uh, much less health care uh, uh, spending per capita in Iraq, uh, you know, as compared compared to Jordan or Lebanon or whatever. Um, you know, and, and there's uh, fewer beds per person just, just down the line, right? Uh, but I, I would say the, the question of, of why Iraq compares negatively in terms of capacity is again, more these, these issues of, of interprovincial management uh, and um, sort of, do we want to have a system, a healthcare system 
uh, that is properly centralized and coordinated as it was uh, prior to 2003. And we've never really been able to ask, answer that question. And because of that, when you have a, a situation like an epidemic, uh, which requires this kind of complex management, uh, it's, it's falling apart. So um, I think the bigger issue is almost sort of healthcare governance more than ventilator numbers and bed numbers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, th thanks for that, uh, Mac. Toby, uh, over to you. There have been several questions looking at the kind of elite politics and, and, and where we see Baghdad's and the governance in Iraq moving. It wouldn't be a panel on Iraq without mentioning Sayyid Muqtada Sadr. Uh, and so the back and forth, again, trying to make sense of the Sadr's movement, your reactions to the different decrees that he has come up with in the last few days, not just on Corona and COVID-19, but also more generally about uh, the reform process. There's another question that if you were to have early elections, do you see an, it viable or feasible that a new party emerges with a reform agenda or a development agenda? Um, or there's another question, is the system, as is the logic of 2003 onwards, able to sustain itself, able to take every challenge and, 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 and overcome the challenges wherever they come, whether it's through protests or oil or a public health catastrophe? And, and, and linked to that, if you can quickly answer another question, which is, okay, so something, someone has mentioned the elephant in the room is corruption. And the word hasn't come up, but clearly in all of our talks, we've been talking about corruption, how important corruption is. Do the elite realize that corruption is a sort of, they're, they're about to hit the iceberg uh, and it's because of corruption. Do you think they'd be willing to perhaps make some changes or are they still interested in, in their own pockets, uh, pockets and, and, and patronage? Over to you. Well, uh, thank you. I think you've given me uh, four questions, one on Sutter and his motivations, one on the outcome, whether, still have five minutes. Uh, whether elections can be um, held early and what the result would be, whether the system is sustainable and the role of corruption. I'm now speeding up. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I think we can pull apart Sutter's behaviour and its effects. Uh, on his his wider movement, both its economic, its military, but also its religious and social arms. Um, and there are, there are some things that I think we can just push to one side as either being illogical or rational or part of a discussion uh, that he's having with himself that makes it out onto Twitter. But I think it's undoubtedly clear that Mohammed Tawfiq Alawi was Sadr's candidate that he pushed him very heavily and that he had a great influence over uh, Mr. Alawi's candidature and his attempts to build a reformist cabinet. And I think that was part of uh, Mr. Alawi's problem, um, that uh, there were a great fear amongst the wider elite that if he became prime minister, he could, I'm not saying he'd want to, but he could have become a vehicle for increased Sadrist power. So when that didn't work, uh, my understanding is that he will give his um, backing to the next man standing, but he's unlikely to become uh, prime minister. So Sutter, his mercurialness or his, 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 uh, his strikes against the demonstrations uh, that I think have clearly undermined his reputation and his ability to mobilize the youth across Iraq, a part of a larger fracturing process that you and I have talked about earlier in this, uh, in, this, in this webinar. And I think they indicate that his position within society is fluid and indeed his control on the different wings of his disparate movement is problematic. Now we move on to the second question, which is <coughs> early elections. I, am, I know uh, that, that each candidate for premiership has promised elections within a year. I think that promise, looking at the legislation going through, that's gone through parliament and looking at what it will need and the, um, the abolition of the Electoral High Commission and the problems that had in trying uh, to regulate the 2018 elections mean that early elections within a year are highly unlikely. I think they're, uh, they're, they're a, a bureaucratic and, and, and legal nightmare. And of course, quite rightly, I think um, the demonstrators have called for the United Nations to take a central role, which in itself 
will take the backing of the Security Council uh, to put the United Nations with the political and international support central to those elections. I would be interested in what Hannah says, but my own reading of the situation will be if those elections happen within, even within the next two years, the vested interests that the, 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 the parties have massed coercive, their ability to yield violence, financial, their resources and their dominance of both the ruling elite and the Iraqi state mean that there is a distinct possibility, if not a probability, that uh, the elections could result in a similar outcome to 2018, which is a low electoral turnout where alienated people have said, why do we vote to this elite? It only encourages them. And that reformist candidates and a reformist party find it very difficult to break the hold of the existing parties, which brings us to the final question, is the system sustainable and the role of corruption? Now, I think we have to understand um, the role of corruption, not only about personal greed, but it's also used structurally to divide up the spoils of the state amongst the ruling elite and the parties who then use that resource to secure their dominance on Iraqi politics which brings us back to why elections may not result in a revolution or a massive change in power. So because corruption is used to empower and enrich the parties and their leadership, any reduction in that corruption, the moving out of party and individual influence, especially amongst the director generals, the so-called private grades at the top of each ministry, is an existential, a direct threat to those parties and their control and power. So corruption isn't necessarily an issue about dishonesty and greed. It's an issue, a central issue about the parties taking money from the state in order to secure their dominance. So corruption, I think, won't be overcome or significantly reduced until those parties, the post-2003 party elite, their grip on power is reduced. Is the system sustainable? I really worry, as Ahmed uh, and Mac have been saying, about the low oil price and the coronavirus has shown that the system itself has bred a lot of its own problems. It can't respond to the health crisis because it's so decentralized and fractured. It's based on a payroll corruption which gives jobs to party uh, followers so therefore cutting uh, payroll budgets is almost impossible or very difficult again because the parties benefit it so much so i think without the consensus a consensus prime ministerial candidate with this fractured competing elite i do think the system is at its most vulnerable with an unchecked coronavirus uh, 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 attacking both the security services, the personnel, and making and putting them in hospital or killing them, and also having a similar effect on the civil service that still deliver the bare needs of the Iraqi population. So this perfect storm that you've described, if married to a reckless use of military power by the United States, could push yeah. Iraq into a situation where the system can't muddle through as it has since 2003. Uh, thank you. Thanks for that, Toby. And definitely something to, for us to keep in mind, the muddle through sort of thesis of Iraqi politics is probably at its uh, weakest point. Um, and, and really, we don't know, sort of, we need to start thinking about what could be an alternative potentially. Um, there's a few questions to Hannah um, and, and joining us uh, again from, from Baghdad. Hannah, uh, the questions are surrounding there's a, there's a big question that you often hear, especially those who are looking for ways forward. What are, the, are the protesters willing to compromise? What are they willing to compromise on to enter into a, the political process? Do they understand, you know, Ahmed is talking about reforms that look like austerity measures to them that would move away from socialism. There are a few questions. Will the protesters be happy with a government that says we will pay less, we will do less socialist activities, we will move towards the private sector? Do you see that happening? The second question, Hannah, to you is um, the role of women, which is very important and you mentioned. Um, what's the proportion of women participating in, in, in these protests and in civil society? Are they participating specifically for women's rights or is it more they're just women that are part of the wider reform movement and do they face any backlash societally for being part of those protests when they go home or, or, or that? What have you been seeing? And the final thing, which is to add to the perfect storm, there's been a question that says, 
there's also a humanitarian crisis and you have the IDPs who aren't coming home. And in the recently liberated areas, what's the update there based on the work that your organization is doing? Um, do you see that as well as being part of this conversation that we're having and trying to understand some of these challenges? Oh yes. Uh, first off, uh, first off thing, I, uh, first I would like to stress that the crisis in our country, its ongoing crisis, is not only um, how we say it, uh, Corona health or uh, decreasing of oil, but also it is a political and security too. This is all. It is how we say it, uh, unified, uh, or we can say a complex crisis in the country is going on, which can really, which we are facing a disaster if it is not used in, or if it is not uh, no, no change in the uh, political process will not go, uh, will not take place. This is. It is really we can say that we are in a very blockage. Uh, how we say it uh, in these days in the political process and uh, we can also at the same time we can say no politician has yet admitted that he needs to review the value system and ideas that drive drive it and this is it is one of the uh, our warning and our uh, how we say it uh, serious uh, alarming about the cha the coming the change should be in this uh, in the country in the political or in the political process so for the uh, protesters and about the if they are going to make some compromise or something this is it depends i can say that this is it depends on the whole development now because it is serious it's not as i said only the corona but it is also the questions of the the oil prices the questions of the health system and the questions of the security we are, we are afraid because in this uh, environment where there is the absence of the state institutions of taking care of the country uh, development or the country existence it is frightening everyone and I think that the uh, young people or the demonstrators will take it into their co into c considerations if they can see some serious from these politicians for the change. But uh, till now, I doubt about it in this uh, in this uh, how we say it, environment. But it depends, I think, with the uh, with the development and with the uh, results of the. Uh, in the few a few weeks will come the development of the uh, corona and the uh, the budget the budget if the budget will not cover the uh, needs the essential needs of the employees within the state which is really uh, eating more than 70% 70 80% of the budget then the situation will be very worse and will be very alarming and each each of uh, each people they are trying to make some how we say uh, to take uh, action in this uh, in this situation then uh, we can say about the women participating women participation uh, as i say it is not only about the questions of women issues in actual fact women they have taken uh, they have uh, participated uh, at the first time, as they are feeling that uh, participating with the men for the national issue, and then it has been changed for the anti-violence against women, and then they change for the other uh, demands on the questions of the women status in Iraq. Anyhow, I think active participation of women in uh, in the situation, in the general situation of the country, and for the development of the country or the future of the political process, it is essential. Especially that these uh, young women, they are with a new, with uh, with uh, vital energy and with the new vision about their role in the uh, in the political and economic and in the cultural fields. Uh, as also one, as I said, security, especially when you speak about 
these uh, vulnerable people of the IDPs about the these uh, in the liberated areas where they have missed uh, you know a lot of services essential services it is they are more than 1 million and take into consideration also that more than 10 million people are under poverty line in Iraq, which they are consist more than 25% of the population. And this is, it is a frightening, it is a humanitarian and it is a, it's a serious crisis now, it will be because they will be affected. They are the first one who has affected from the uh, economic or from the uh, security or from the health system and health caring, the absence of health caring. Adding to that, adding to that, the list of the, uh, how we say, medical services in the country. If you compare in 2011, there was, there was two, uh, 220, uh, 225 hospitals. In 2011, uh, it is only 226. So what is the uh, new services is being, in, uh, how we say, built or it has been created? Nothing, not so much, not so much. Comparing with the needs of the populations, they are now over 40. And in the uh, 2011, we were only maybe uh, 30, 30, 32. So this is, it is really one, one of the things that we have to, to be very uh, alarming uh, on the situation and the, uh, the development of the uh, situation in this country which is Thank really, if, uh, if there is no change, the disasters will be very deepened and uh, there, there will be this, you know, anti-corruptions or anti, uh, how we say, uh, uh, can say anti-proportions or anti-sectarianism would be weakened if there is no development of the political uh, movement, of the new image of the political organizations or political parties, and to make more, how we say, unifying, you know, across the religious or across sectarian or across nationalities, ethnicities in the country of working together. Thank you. This is also depends on the, uh, all, all this should be taken into consideration in the development in the coming uh, months. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, that was uh, a, a sort of very sort of grim outlook on, on the sort of political structure. Um, Ahmed, uh, there's been a question that I want to point to, to sort of throw over to you. Um, an investor sitting, listening to this uh, broadcast, this, this conversation would conclude that Iraq is closed for business. Um, and, and of course, that can't be a, a good thing. And, and so people often use, although we disagree with this term, a failed state. Um, rather than just talking about the challenges, do you, what would you sort of, in your view, look at as potential solutions out of this mess? COVID-19, oil price, understanding the short and medium term implications, are you looking towards, I mean, there have been efforts of the private sector that haven't really worked yet. How would you think sort of as a potential solution to move past the bureaucracy? And I understand it's a very difficult question. That's why I'm asking it to you. That's difficult. I'm already an investor in Iraq and I've been investing for a number of years uh, there. Basically, the, the, the whole idea is the state might very well have serious issues because it is organized the wrong way. I mean, it's not a question of private uh, sector versus socialism. It's basically, it's a failed process. Uh, when we focused exclusively, let's say, on uh, paying salaries as, as instead of building infrastructure, that's the issue. It's not the issue of that we take care of people or socialism. It's the issue of misspending. We cannot spend on salaries without spending on infrastructure. Now, the thing is, if you ask, what does Iraq have, in a sense? Iraq has, in a sense, okay, the oil wealth is incredible. We all know that. But that's actually going to be quite a different story because, in a way, it's almost like a stranded asset. But the difficult difference between all of this is that Iraq has got a very young population. It's got an internal market. I mean, many parts of the world, in a way, like look at the Middle East, whereby people will focus on the private sector, on the, uh, on, on the young part of the private sector. Uh, all, the, all the countries don't have what Iraq has, which is basically a huge internal market made up of 40 million people. Um, if you've, I mean, I've spent the last 
let's say a couple of years or so uh, uh, when I returned to Iraq, working with young entrepreneurs. They have all the abilities that you see elsewhere. Their obstacles, as difficult as they seem, as difficult as they are, let's say, in people's eyes, because we tend to think linearly, we think of, we have to do A, B, and C. But if you see, for example, what has happened in Africa, I mean, everybody says Iraq is a failed state. I don't really believe it's a failed state. It's a state which has a failed political system, a failed way of governing, but not as a failed state. You look at what can be worse than Iraq if you look at Africa in terms of the disasters that there are there. But if you can see what the private investment, the private sector has done in terms of getting people off, because really the one thing that kills Iraqis, that stops the economy growing, is basically lack of funding, for example, uh, lack of uh, 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 fintech. All of these things have changed the uh, uh, part of the world that people have almost given up on. Uh, so. Iraq, is it? No, I mean, like there are huge opportunities, but what we need is actually the, the change in mentality. One of the reasons why, for example, give an idea uh, on, on salaries. Currently, uh, one of the biggest losses we have in, in the uh, provision of electricity is 40% of the electricity generated is lost in distribution, i.e. it's lost when it goes to people's homes. What it needs is something like eight to $10 billion over a number of years. That is less than three months worth salaries. I mean, in a sense, if we can build a structure whereby a private investor uh, can come in and get returns, that's what I mean by we need to remove fuel subsidies, we need to remove price controls and so forth, because then you can make an economic argument that actually looking at this, i.e. spending this much, I get this much return, I can charge this much for it, you can make a difference. But what stopped all along, what stopped almost everything, is the state is controlling almost everything. The socialist mentality that we have in a sense of foreigners are here to rape the country, to take money from us, et cetera, and so forth. And what we create, we create impossible situations. We, I mean, if you just look at, you know, one of the big things that we're arguing about right now is, let's say, um, dependence on Iranian gas. And people are saying, oh, why don't you uh, uh, flare as more gas? But people don't realize that the Basra gas company had enormous difficulties in terms of justifying the financial returns of it. We wanted to uh, uh, you know, capture the gas, but we don't want to make money. It just doesn't make sense. The changes are possible, but the only the biggest issue with all of these changes comes back to the political system. Because once you do these changes, then you remove the, the, the thing that allows you to buy loyalties, it, it removes the ability to you to, to, to build your crony networks that we've had in the past. And that again comes back to what Toby said earlier, is that you cannot remove that. You remove that, remove the foundations of the system. That's why I end up by saying difficult choices have to be made. And with that, I end. Thank you, Ahmed, for that. Um, we're, we're, we just have about 10 minutes left and, and there's been a few questions to get to the sort of immediate crisis uh, uh, that's affecting the whole world, really, again, back to COVID-19, Mac, there's a few questions uh, addressed to you. You've described, you've given a very good outlook of the kind of the, the deep state of, of public health and, and how that's developed. But the crisis is happening now and the problem is now. And, and, and there's a very simple question. Does Iraq need international aid to fight uh, COVID-19? What are the immediate steps to help in place of, of the system that you've described? And there's another question, which is we've seen in many parts, this question is coming from the UK, a kind of community response to COVID-19. Um, have you noticed in a similar way, a community response to COVID-19, uh, people coming together to support the vulnerable, to support others uh, in Iraq based on, on, on your observations? Thanks. Um, so the answer to the first question is, is pretty simple. It's uh, yes, they do need aid. And in fact, uh, there is a concerted effort out of uh, both the president's office and several other agencies uh, to, to raise money uh, towards uh, protective equipment and towards the necessary kinds of technologies. China really is the only actor right now that has been helping Iraq uh, in terms of aid. Um, well, and then you have the WHO, which is providing this kind of very important coordinating role. Um, but uh, they do need money. The, the, the healthcare sector has had a huge uh, budget shortfall for the last few years. 
and it's even more pronounced uh, at the moment. And so uh, aid, uh, emergency aid as a first step, and then hopefully after this crisis uh, dissipates, uh, so it's a, a kind of look at the more structural issues will be, import will be important. As for the community responses, uh, the only reason why uh, there has been something uh, that we might call healthcare over the last um, you know, 15 years has been because of this, um, uh, both uh, you know, networks among doctors uh, that, that have formed in order to meet structural gaps, but then also uh, patients themselves. Uh, doctors, uh, when it comes to the current crisis, you know, they, they've, they've created these sort of ad hoc uh, uh, scientific committees uh, to uh, conduct trainings. They've uh, raised funds, uh, you know, uh, for uh, purchasing uh, protective equipment. On the, um, on the community side, which is often, uh, you know, essentially the main factor in making sure that people have access to the money and to the, the kind of uh, medical know-how that they need to navigate a very complex and fragmented system. Uh, in relation to COVID-19, it is somewhat less, uh, and that's because uh, you know, this is a, uh, uh, a kind of uh, epidemic uh, that discourages uh, social interaction and discourages social response. There has been this sort of, you know, um, um, you know, uh, uh, online activism to raise awareness and this kind of thing, but the, the normal sorts of patient social networks that enable care are not uh, not so much uh, on the forefront in this case, but certainly doctor networks. These informal doctor networks are very important. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Toby, uh, one quick final question to you. Um, people, you know, there, there's a question on early elections and whether do you see sort of significant change coming from early, uh, of early elections. Do you see the protesters mobilizing into a, a, a coherent political stream that could contest elections or, or, you know, or, or do you see that as, as, as not viable? And please just uh, one or two minutes. Yeah, I, I mean, there is some debate on this and um, I don't want to seem like a, a killjoy or particularly cynical, but what I would put on the table is that elections require resource, a large resource. They require money to mobilize, access to the media, uh, and a, a, a kind of structured, organized institutional bureaucracy within parties to deliver people onto the streets to mobilize and, to, and, and, and get the votes out. Now, against that background, what the the, the existing post-2003 parties, whose leadership are responsible for the mess that Iraq now is in, have are very deep reservoirs of money. Uh, a lot of them also have very close relations with state institutions, which is why IHEC, the High Electoral Council, was disbanded after 2018. The new electoral laws are indeed ambitious, and the call for the central role of the United Nations offers hope but where my cynicism or where my worry comes in is that those vested interests that money that coercion that set that shadow state of party political networks that runs across the extent of iraq is very hard to dislodge so on one side you have undoubtedly a mass movement from october 2019 onwards which, which i am sure represents a broad popular and nationwide alienation with as ahmed very astutely calls this failed system but turning that into an electoral machine that delivers votes to one or two parties that can undermine the grip of the dominant post 2003 parties on the system that's where I worry that won't happen. Now, what others have said in response to that is this can be evolution, not revolution. That's, this will slowly eat away at party dominance. What I'd say is I hope so, but that dominance at the moment is almost total and far from benign. It doesn't play by the rules. It invents the rules to empower the, 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 the ruling elite that, 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 that is currently... Um, uh, d d ma making Iraqi politics in its own image. Now, what we've discussed at the beginning of this podcast is the fracturing of elite consensus. 
One wonders if that elite believes that they're faced by an existential threat, a, a, a grassroots movement that could threaten their, their, their extended grip on power and everything that comes with it. Will they then bandy together? Will they, they come back mm -hmm. together on consensus to suppress that movement? I think that's an interesting question, but you do need adjudication. Yes. You do need something that stops that elite using their wealth, using their coercion, and using their control of the state to their mm -hmm. straightforward advantage in the next set of elections. Thank you, uh, uh, Toby. Um, and just as a quick, because we've we have a few minutes left, two minutes left. A quick recap. I think what we're hearing is the system obviously is, is moving towards this, what we're calling, I suppose, for lack of a better word, a perfect storm. All of these impediments were questioning whether the muddle through sort of thesis that has defined Iraq will, will work. Will it continue to work? The elite are fragmented. The political blocs are fragmented. They're unable to uh, come up with a prime minister and, and, and really to work in their, the community's sort of self-interest of that elite. The protesters have, to some extent, changed the name of the game. They've changed the narratives of the game. They have had an impact on the political system more than previous protesters. Um, and so the question then becomes, what is the role? And I think as part of our Iraq initiative, we look at what is the role of the Iraqi government? What is the role of the protesters? And what's also the role of international actors in all of this? Um, because we want to move away from the past failures and, and, and we're worried that we see the same mistakes being repeated. You have in Iraq, it's not all gloom, uh, grim, as Ahmed says, you have people and institutions that are willing to bring about reform. So it's about how to connect those connective tissues of, of reformists and the willing to move forward and what then becomes the role of the protesters in, in this system. And, and finally, what is the role of international actors, diplomats, and the sort of investment community in not just repeating those same mistakes. So I just wanted to thank uh, all of the speakers for, for joining us today, offering great insights into uh, really what is Iraq today vis-a-vis -vis all of these threats and, and, and sort of problems that we see, but also what are the ways out? And as part of the Iraq initiative, we're going to continue to try and come up with potential ways out as well, because as Ahmed says, it's not a failed state. Uh, it's, it's a system that requires tremendous uh, and considerable reform, but there are ways out and that's kind of the way that we would like to go. Thank you everyone else for joining us. Uh, this was, as you all know, our first, uh, online seminar, online roundtable. We're used to having these in persons where I can make jokes and not hear people laugh. Now I'm making jokes and I can't hear people laugh. So that's very similar. And I also wanted to remind everybody uh, and thank everybody as well for, for I'm sure that those of you joining have run out of your Netflix movies and hopefully the, there'll be more and more Netflix shows coming in. So we could also have that entertainment. And finally, to remind everybody that our next online uh, seminar online roundtable will be on the 15th of April. Uh, it'll be closed, but it'll be in conversation with uh, the Minister of Electricity. As the summer approaches, one of the key indicators has always been, will there be electricity? Uh, and, and that question can't, you know, is, is as vital as ever. So we'll have a sort of another more closed for, for our Iraq initiative sponsors and, and also for our network and I wanted to finally thank those supporters and sponsors of the Iraq initiative please visit our website to see more of the docu art articles and research that we're doing uh, and to thank everybody and also the Middle East North Africa program at Chatham House's team for bringing us all into the digital age that's all for now thank you very much